Well, let's turn to the book of Romans. Our service has been rich in scripture, and we're going to finish it that way as well, getting even richer. Romans chapter 12. And this week, believe it or not, we're going to be finishing out uh, this chapter. Having spent many months here, we've been seeing that uh, Romans 12 is all about the uh, qualities of true Christianity. Uh, it's all about the qualities that make our faith real. And there are powerful things that can uh, shine the light of Christ in a dark world. The problem with the darkness is not the darkness. It's the light that's not shining in the darkness. And we are the solution to that. And Romans 12 tells us just the ways in which that can happen. We saw that of all the virtues that Paul commends here, only three of them uh, show up two times, twice in the space of a single chapter. It seems that three virtues are kind of the, the uh, cream of the cream when it comes to the qualities of true Christianity, and that is number one, humility, number two, brotherly love, by which they'll know we're his disciples, and then number three, as we've been seeing starting last week, is mercy. Of these three, we saw the most important is humility, if you're counting the verses in chapter 12 that Paul devotes to them. And if humility is the first, then mercy is really a close second, which is why we've been spending two weeks on it. Paul devotes uh, seven verses to humility, and then fully six to mercy, starting in verse 14, where he says, bless those who bless you, bless and curse not. And then he picks it up again in verse 17, where he says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. And then he sums it up. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with uh, good. Last week we saw that God says, I will repay evil. That we don't dare take up the sword because it's a hairy carry sword of vengeance that always turns on ourselves. Bitterness is a poison pill that we swallow to get back at the other person. <laughs> Never do that, he says. This week we'll say, you don't repay evil. You repay evil with good. Last week we focused on the warning, and that is this, never take your own revenge. Never, ever pay back evil for evil to anyone, for vengeance is mine, says the Lord. We saw that sweet revenge is a bitter pill to swallow. Uh, that we saw the, all the ways in which God takes revenge. God is a God of justice who brings back our deeds on our own head. And he does that in his mercy to wake us up and to discipline us. He takes care of all of that. It's all through the scriptures and powerful teaching there. That's the warning. Don't try to do that yourself. This week we'll focus on the wisdom, a truly otherworldly wisdom, and that is Reading again, never pay, verse 17, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. Let's start to unpack this. If possible, so far as depends on you, be at peace with all men. Now, to begin with, what he's saying here is this. Never pay back evil for evil, but by the way, first, don't bring it on yourself. Don't invite evil against yourself and then blame them for doing it. If you're going to be persecuted, he's saying, let it because, be because you're saintly, not just because you're fleshly or stubborn or stupid. Paul's saying, let's get that straight before we go, go any further. For goodness sake, and here it is, respect what is right in the sight of all men and go, go, go trampling over that. That is, don't go around needlessly stepping on toes. Don't be a bull in a china closet. Don't get everyone mad at you and then come crying to me as though you're the victim. Some people need to hear this. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. Not everything is worth making an issue of, and some of you may need to tread a little more lightly. Some of you may need to work on going the extra mile not to give an offense needlessly by what you say or do. Paul tells us elsewhere in 2 Corinthians 8, what does this mean? Well, 2 Corinthians 8, he had regard for what is honorable 
not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. He was talking about his financial dealings here, and to make a long story short, he went to great pains to avoid even the appearance of evil. Evil in the way he delivered some money that he raised uh, to the church in Jerusalem. And so he ended up doing far more than he would have had to do in God's eyes to stick to the letter of the law. Because he had regard for uh, what is honorable in man's eyes too. Christ himself followed this principle. In Matthew 27, they came to Peter and told him to pay up on some taxes. So Peter came to Christ and said, what should we do? And Jesus spoke to him saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax? From their sons or from strangers? And upon saying from strangers, Jesus said to him, consequently, the sons are exempt. That is, we're really exempt in God's eyes. I am because I'm the son. He's saying, this is a no-brainer. Don't, you don't tax the government, and I'm the king of kings and the lord of lords, and I am the government, and the government will be on my shoulders. But, he said, and listen to this, lest we give them offense, go to the sea and throw in a hook, and you know the rest of the story lest we give them offense. The literal translation is, lest we cause them to stumble, pay it. He didn't want those tax collectors to stumble. Maybe Zacchaeus was among them that day. He didn't want him needlessly to stumble because he was out for the salvation of his soul. This may have led to Zacchaeus' salvation. Who knows? He wanted them to be saved, and so he paid the tax, even though by rights he didn't have to. How an American. Because there are often higher issue at stake than what's you know best for us materially, and that is what's best for them spiritually. Which is why Paul goes on to say in the next verse, back to Romans 12, verse 18, as far as depends on you, be at peace with all men. And why be at peace? Well, it's like it says in 1 Timothy 2, that our goal should be to lead peaceable lives in all godliness and dignity because he desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And we on the Christian right have to be very careful how we're coming across and what we're demanding and what we're saying because so often we don't respect what is right in the sight of all men. Heaven and hell are ultimately at stake here because where people go in eternity will turn to a good degree on what they see from us uh, in time, what they see in us. And so never pay back evil for evil to anyone, verse 17. And of course, don't needlessly provoke it. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. So far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Don't be a bull in a china closet. Don't be needlessly you know, provocative. Don't be like those who get uh, angry about stuff that they brought on a lot there. <clears throat> uh, but be at peace. But if all that fails, if someone still hurts you, then what you do is this. You turn on the warmth and not the heat. You turn on the light of our love. Reading on verse 19. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance of mine is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will reap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Again, this is truly uh, otherworldly, un-American wisdom, and that is this. Paul sums it up in the last verse, the last verse of this great chap chapter. Uh, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And how do you do that? Well, he gives one example just before that. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. There's a lot here. So important is this that it's in the Sermon on the Mount even. If you'll turn there, turn to Matthew 5. Matthew 5, starting in verse 43. Matthew 5, 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? 
If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? Therefore you are to be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. He's saying, look at what God does all the time. Is what Paul says in Acts 14. To the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. They were, e uh, they were evil. But did he zap them for it? No, he did not leave himself without a witness in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your evil hearts with food and gladness. It's like we sang earlier, for the beauty of the earth, for the, glor the, for, for the glory of the skies, for the love, fatherly love, uh, uh, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. For each perfect gift of thine to our evil race, so Eve freely given, grace is human and divine, flowers of earth and buds of heaven. For every good and perfect gift is from above, James 1.16, coming down from the Father of lights on all men. And according to Christ, we're to be like that too. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. By which he means you're to be mature. mature. And Paul sums it up in the same way here in Romans 12, 21. That's the scriptural background. Do not be, uh, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And as we do that, what happens as a result? In many ways, this is the heart of the passage. Next word. For in so doing, you will reap burning coals on his head. It's a kind of vengeance, but it's a good kind of vengeance. The idea of burning coals is that you'll as we all know, bring conviction onto them and purification and maybe ultimately redemption. You'll free them to become better persons. Might not happen right away, but the idea is that more often than not, in extending mercy, we, we, it, that mercy which comes from the Father in heaven through the Spirit of Christ in us is a powerful thing. That mercy um, uh, burns away their propensity to evil as they burn with conviction. We heal them. It's that you'll change them for good when you forgive them. You'll change the world for good. The church can change the world for good. Just like Christ uh, did. Now Paul focuses here on what mercy does for the one who receives it. What forgiveness does for the one who really deserves justice. You'll bring on conviction, a purification, redemption, a freedom that they can receive if they, if they choose to. And especially with our loved ones, that can happen. And we all need that kind of burning. Isn't that what we want to happen? So often we think we'll change them by vengeance. God says, you'll change them by forgiveness. We think we'll change them by getting angry, by you know, teaching them a lesson that they'll never forget. God says to teach them a lesson that they'll never forget by giving mercy. In some ways he's saying, you feel like killing them? Well, do it. Kill them with kindness. Which is why I've titled this message, Killing with Kindness. Because kindness will bring on a conviction that will kill what's wrong with them far better than you ever could do it with vengeance. Fleshly reactions. It's a very simple teaching that needs no explanation. Really, if you think about it, all it needs is some illustrations, which is what we're going to do today, like Christ did. I'm going to tell some stories that illustrate this very simple but very profound teaching in order to win it home to our hearts, because I need that, and I'm sure you do too. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, for in so doing you will heap burning coals upon their head. There are many stories, both from Scripture and outside of Scripture. It's like David. Do you know that his doing this once saved his life? Doing good to those who persecuted him? is. Here's what killing with kindness looks like and what it does, what coals of fire look like, if you'll turn to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 24. Let's just let God's word have its way in our heart as we read the story. Now when Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. 
Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the rocks of the wild goats. He came to the sheepfolds on the way where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the inner recesses of the cave. The men of David said to him, Behold, this is the day of which the Lord has said to you, Behold, I am going to give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as, he see, as seems good to you. Then David arose and cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly. It came about afterwards that David's conscience bothered him because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe of the Lord's anointed. So he said to his men, Far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. David pursued his men, uh, persuaded his men with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul arose and left the cave and went his way. Now afterward, David arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king! And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the ground and prostrated himself. David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men, saying, Behold, David seeks to harm you? Behold, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord had given you today into my hand in the cave. And some said to kill you, but my eye had pity on you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against the Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Now my father see, indeed, see the edge of your robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the edge of your robe and did not kill you, know and perceive that there is no evil or rebellion in my hands, and I have not sinned against you, though you are lying in wait for my life to take it. May the Lord judge. May the Lord judge between me and you. And may the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. Never take your own revenge. As the proverb of the ancient says, out of the wicked comes forth wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the Lord of Israel, the King of Israel, come out? Whom are you pursuing? A dead dog? A single flea? The Lord, therefore, judge and decide between me and you, and may he see and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. This is, this is our passage in Romans 12, perfectly fleshed out. When David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? Then Saul lifted his voice and wept, burning coal. He said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have dealt well with me while I have dealt wickedly with you. You have declared today that you have done good to me for my evil. That the Lord has delivered me into your hand, yet you did not kill me. For if a man finds his enemy, will he not go oh, will he let him go away safely? May the Lord therefore reward you with good in return for what you have done to me this day. Now, therefore, behold, I know that you will surely be king. The power, the illuminating power, the transforming power of repaying evil with good. I know that now, Saul said. And that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hand. So now swear to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants after me and that you will not destroy my name from my father's household. David, he did another good deed. David swore it to Saul. And Saul went to his home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. Coals of fire. Many examples. Maybe you've been abandoned by a loved one or by a friend or by many friends. What do you do then? Especially when they come home. Each situation is unique, and God will have to guide you, but here's the most relevant scripture uh, that I know of. In some ways, no message on forgiveness would be complete without this passage in Luke 15, if you'll turn there. Luke 15, starting in verse 11. And he said, a man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, 
Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and sent him, he sent him into fields uh, to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, interesting, before the father could even hardly even see him and what his condition was like. While he was still a long way off, before he ever heard his repentance, His father saw him and felt compassion for him and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring out the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again and he was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing, and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. And because, and he beca but he became angry, and he was not willing to go in, and his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours, and never have you ever given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice. For this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live, and he was lost and has been found. So who are you like? The father or the brother? But they abandoned the family, and I stayed faithful. At the very least, they should repent. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion on him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The idea being long before he could really see him, much less hear him, he felt compassion for him. Long before his son would ask forgiveness from him, he felt compassion for him and welcomed him home. He didn't just tolerate him. He embraced him and celebrated him. And you can be sure that that added coals of fire to his, uh, his confession and it went far deeper and his redemption was far greater. It's called prevenient grace, which is grace that comes to us long before we ever repented or believed. And you can do it because the same Father, we can all do it, the same Father is in us to do it through us. Something that he is doing all the time, as we've read. Therefore, be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Doesn't mean you never confront sin or exercise tough love, but, it, but it's all got to be couched in the same fatherly compassion that we see in the, in the story of the prodigal son. And only then will we be qualified to speak the truth if God calls us to. Of course, the greatest example of all, let me give you one more from the scripture, is Christ himself. 
who uh, did the same thing, who forgave long before they ever repented. And the most powerful example of it in his life, not just of forgiving, but of burning coals, is what happened at Calvary. It says in Luke 23 that when the centurion saw the way he died, he began praising God. There's a lot involved in the way he died, but overall, Christ took a forgiving posture on the cross and a climax when he said, Father, forgive them as, he was, as they were nailing him, for they know not what they do. When the centurion saw the way he died, he began praising God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. Christ was after the salvation of his soul. And it started to happen. The one who was crucifying God became, began praising God. And get this, it says, All the crowds who came together for this spectacle, when they observed what had happened, began to return beating their breasts. They went from berating him to beating their breasts thanks to the burning coals of his forgiving words. Thanks to the burning coals of the way he died. He, he, he killed them with kindness. And they were convicted to the point of repentance, beating their breasts. And that is how God changes the world. Chris Carrier of Coral Gables, Florida, was abducted when he was 10 years old. True story. His kidnapper was angry with the boy's family for some reason, and so he kidnapped their son, and he burned him with cigarettes. He stabbed him numerous times with an ice pick, and then he shot him in the head and uh, left him to die in the Everglades. 10-year-old kid. Remarkably, the boy survived, though he'd lost sight in one eye. No one was ever arrested. Recently, a man confessed to the crime, and Chris, who's now a youth minister at Granada Presbyterian Church, went to see him. He was living in North Miami Beach in a nursing home. His name was David McAllister, a 77-year-old ex-convict who, by the time Chris met him, was frail and, get this, blind. Interesting, he was blind. Thanks to him, Christ, uh, Chris lost an eye, and God repaid him, just like we saw he does last week, to get our attention again and again. Chris began visiting him. He began visiting often. He began reading to McAllister from the Bible and praying with him. And his ministry opened the door for McAllister to make a profession of faith. His compassion led to redemption. They didn't arrest McAllister because after 22 years, the statute of limitations on the crime was long past. Justice was never served. Or was it? Many people couldn't understand how he could forgive David McAllister, of all people. Here's what Chris said as to why he did it. From my point of view, I could not not forgive him. If I'd chosen to hate him all those years or spent my life looking for revenge, then I wouldn't be the man I am today. The man my wife and children love. The man God has helped me to be. Oh, do not be overcome by evil whether it comes from inside or outside your family, inside or outside the church family, never. Be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. It's what Fan T. Kim Pook did. I'll close with this. Remember her? Remember the famous picture of the little Vietnamese girl way back during the Vietnam War, naked, running from the napalm attack? If you served in Vietnam, maybe you've been haunted by that picture or angered by it. 
The photographer, as some of you know, won the Pulitzer Prize for it, and it helped turn the nation against the war. Did, do any of you know what happened to her by any chance? A couple of you do. Her name was Fan Thi Kim Phuc, and here's the rest of the story. The photographer rushed her to the hospital where she was treated for third-degree burns, this little 10-year-old girl. Her, wo her wounds were so severe that every time they were clean cleaned and dressed, the pain caused her to lose consciousness. Later, the communist government discovered that she was the girl in the picture. So they used her for propaganda purposes. They paraded her around as an anti-American anti propaganda. They forced her to pull up her sleeves and show her skin, her deeply ridged skin, to visitors from around the world. Then a group of Believers in Vietnam introduced her to Christ. She went to Cuba where the Vietnamese government allowed its citizens to go and she, there she met a young Vietnamese man who was also a believer and, and they married and on their honeymoon they defected to Canada. Getting off the plane in a strange country, country they had no money, no family, no friends. Kim Phuc said she was buoyed up only by her faith she told an NPR reviewer, uh, interviewer, God guided me, I go by faith. Today the couple lives in Toronto with their small son. Chuck Colson told the rest of the story in a Christianity Today article. He said this, War, the thunder of bombs, the wail of the wounded, the sharp smell of fear, it's something you never get used to. I felt it years ago as a Marine lieutenant, knowing that the lives of 50 men were in my hands. Later in the White House, I never lost the brooding realization that every decision I influenced could mean life or death to soldiers fighting in the jungles of Vietnam. But the most wrenching sense of responsibility hit when I climbed into the back seat of the White House limousine, opened the newspaper, and saw a photo of a 10-year-old South Vietnamese girl running naked down the street, the gelled napalm searing her skin after a bomb attack ordered by a U.S. commander. Then, decades later, one day last fall, I opened the newspaper and a second photo jumped out at me. Kim Phuc, now 33 years old, was laying a wreath of flowers at the Vietnam War Memorial. There she stood, slim and radiant before the black polished granite, with a remarkable message. She was extending forgiveness to those who once bombed her family and countrymen. She said, I have suffered a lot from both physical and emotional pain. Sometimes I thought I could not live, but God saved my life and gave me faith and hope. She later told a reporter that the sea of veterans in American uniforms spread out before her. That, 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 that sight brought back terrifying memories as she forgave them. She said she prayed for strength to utter words of grace and hope. She told these men, even if I could talk face to face with the pilot who dropped the bomb, I would tell them we cannot change history, but we should try to do good things. Sound familiar? Repay evil with good things. We should try to do good things for the present and the future to promote peace. Her remarks were very brief, but poignant. When she finished them, the veterans rose to their feet and like exploded in applause. Many broke down and wept. One said, it's important for us that she's here. For her to forgive us personally means a lot. Colson said, and it means something to me as well, to that old Nixon hatchet man that I was. The frail South Vietnamese woman, once so powerless, reached out across the years, as it were, to the men who once held so much worldly power and spoke words of forgiveness and reconciliation. Colson concluded, from Kim Phuc's first picture, the world learned the horrors of war. From the second picture, the only source of peace, whether in the family, or in the country, or in the world.
the only power, she revealed the only power that conquers sin and evil is the cross. And what happened there? And we are called to take up our crosses daily and follow him. Even that's not the end of the story. Kim and her husband had a secret dream of attending a Bible college someday. And when Colson retold the story on his radio program Breakpoint, several Bible colleges called and, and offered full scholarships to make the couple's dream come true. Why repay evil with good? Well, because of what it does for them and because of what it will do for you. Paul has both in mind, as does our Father in heaven. What do you do when they abandon you? We cannot change history, but we should try to do good things for the present and the future, she said, to promote peace. Which is just what Paul is saying. And it's just what God the Father and God the Son has been doing and is doing to this day. And it starts right here with one another through the mercy that has got to be at the heart of a truly caring community. Therefore, Paul said in Galatians 6, let us do good, let us do this to all men, but especially to what? To those who are of the household of faith. Just like he does.